Sierra J holds this area. And Japan, once again, this is the famous cartel of Japan's cannon, which is blowing through all the treaties, all the promises. Nine Power Treaty, Kellogg Bryan Pact. League, what's the Kellogg Bryan Pact again? Like, what was that? Kellogg and Bryan, they negotiated. Okay, and what's the negotiate? What's the result of that negotiation? Oh, like, they could have. They would not use. War as. They would not use war as uh, their foreign policy. Yeah. Yeah. So nine power treaty. What's nine power treaty? What is that about? We, we did this yesterday. Wasn't the naval? Washington. They would not attack each other. No, not that. Would respect the territorial integrity of China. So they would not attack China. Kellogg Bryan Pact is. They will not use war as a policy. The League of Nations Covenant peace. is peace and self, uh, self-determination and co- no, collective security. Uh, World Court, kind of like the, the League of Nations, the judging them, the Leighton Report. The Japanese government promises, whatever promises they made, treaty or whatever, Shanghai Port Treaty. So here you have a bunch of treaties, Japan just blows through them all in one. Right? And of course here you have China in here. And here you have Japan's battleships on this area and another Japanese grabbing another bullet. And that's, this is one of the famous cartoons discussing Manchuria. So, that's Japan descending down a dark valley. Now, the second Sino-Japanese war happens as, as a result that the army continues to, ex- uh, wants to continue to expand, but they did achieve, but they had a truce. Between 1933 to 1937, Japan and China did not have any major conflicts. Of course, they had those uh, small disagreements. China, the Japanese and China had a hard time because the Chinese did not like them and they protested at them. And at the same time, you know, the relationships were tense, but it was no, there was no official fighting at that time. In uh, 1936, there was a coup d'état. Coup d'état is spelled like this. What's a coup d'état? Getting rid of a leader by force. Yeah, getting re- rid of a leader by force, or having basically taking over the government by force. It's a rebellion. So the military actually had a coup d'état in Japan in 1936. It was a failure. However, it it, it even though it failed, it showed that it it increased their popularity. And it also showed the lack of control over the military. Why would the military rebel against their own government? Think about that for a second. What happens with the, if the Korean military takes over the, the Korean government? Does that make does that even make sense? The government has no control over the military, right? And you and you'll notice that in Japan, a constant theme is the mil, the government and the military is separate. They don't rule. They don't control each other. How come it failed? We're not going to go into those details. But you just need to know there was one and it failed and and it not only not only did it not hurt the military government, it increased their popularity. Popularity of military. Yeah, popularity of militarism. Was it Chinese military? No, no, it was the Japanese military. Taking over Japanese. Yeah. The Japanese military taking over the Japanese government. <clears throat> After that, the Marco Polo Bridge incident happened where there was a skirmish between the two, uh, China and uh, Japan again. Japan claimed that China, some Chinese uh, military, um, kidnapped some Japanese soldiers over to their side. And so Japan's like, we need to come over to take a look. Japan's, uh, China's like, no way. <laughs> we didn't kidnap anybody. Japan's like, you kidnapped somebody. And so they charged over, and then, and then that was called the Marco Polo Bridge incident, where they started fighting. And once again, Japan used an excuse, which is pretty much ungrounded, to start a conflict. And so that was the Marco Polo Bridge incident. The Japanese charged over, and uh, the Japanese called it the China incident. They called it the China incident. All right, so Marco Polo Bridge incident. The Japanese called it the China incident. The Chinese called it the Marco Polo Bridge incident. Um, but one thing you need to note is Japan never, ever, officially declared war on China. Japan did not declare war on China, even up to this point. 
they charged over, took over, and right after this, they took over Beijing, Shanghai, Nanjing. They never declared war. <clears throat> nationalism was high on both sides. Both the Chinese were national, had na had a lot of nationalism. The Japanese had, were nationalistic, and they they were high on both sides, and they wanted to just go at each other by that time because all the previous tensions built up to that moment. There was an escalation of tensions over time. And um, I'm going to assign you guys a reading soon after this. But through this, it was obvious that, uh, but once this happened, it was obvious that Japan had no clear plan. They did not really know what they were doing. They knew what they were doing, but they had no long-term plan. The Battle of Shanghai started, and that eventually led to the Nanjing Massacre, which we have already uh, researched. Which we've already looked at. So the timeline is peace, failed coup. 1937, there was Marco Polo Bridges in, no clear plan, Shanghai, Nanjing. And that was the road to war. Okay. Now, let's see. What time is this class in? Five. Five. What? Four minutes. Ten four minutes? Okay, that's good. Hey, Sue, can you stop that then? I'm going to assign you guys your homework. Uh, I'm, thinking I might, I might simply, I'm thinking I might just postpone the test, uh, depending on when you guys are ready. 